Hello, welcome. Um, this talk is about Adam. My name is Dag Wiers. Um, I've been here a few times in the past, but it was five years ago, two children ago, some weight ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it's nice to be back. Um, this time it's about uh, a project that I'm involved with. It, myself, I'm a, I'm a freelance, um, well, system administrator or system engineer. Um, so not really something that is related to this project, um, but anyhow. Um, the project is uh, a time-lap project. A time-lap is an organization. It's an, uh, um, a non-profit organization in Ghent, which is like uh, a fab lab. Uh, it brings people together to work on uh, creating stuff. They have uh, laser cutters, uh, 3D printers, uh, CNC uh, freezing machines. I don't know if, if it's in English like that. Uh, it's called that in English. Um, but it was based, it was founded in 2010 out of a, a different organization, but uh, they reoriented to becoming a fab lab. And um, they also do projects, so they, they uh, from time to time, I think twice a year, they, they think of new projects to do and finding people to, and motivating people to, to, as a volunteer, to work on those projects. And um, these are citizen projects in the sense that they try to motivate just citizens, not uh, professionals, uh, not uh, science people. It's not paid for, so it's purely vo on a voluntary basis. Um, Timelap also does workshops uh, related to um, creating stuff and using the machines and, and a lot of other stuff as well. Also uh, around uh, project management and things that are also needed to, to, to have successful projects. They also do boot camps, they do Arduino jams, like 48 hours um, Arduino jams. Uh, and they also pay for uh, residencies for art project uh, for art students or uh, st students that have a nice idea. They have to uh, to answer to a call for papers. They have, uh, I think, two apartments where people ca can live. So it's usually international people that can add something to TimeLab, and at TimeLab can also add something to their project. Um, they also use their space for people for free if you want to have a space where you want to work. Um, so you don't even have to be a member to, to make use of their space. Uh, and they have free Friday lunches. <laughs> um, it's supported by the city of Ghent and the Flemish government, but it's not self-sufficient. So they do uh, require you to pay something if you want to make use of their equipment uh, on a continuous basis. Except, of course, if you're involved in one of those creation projects, like I am with Adam. So, if, what does it look like? It's something like this. It's actually much larger, but this is a, a view of what, uh, what it looks like on a busy day. Uh, and the nice thing, obviously, is that it brings people together. So, uh, you learn a lot if, you have a, if, you have a, if you're stuck with something, uh, you can ask anyone. Uh, using the machines or even technical stuff or explaining something. So it's like Froscon a bit. <laughs> um, we have a very nice logo because we also have designers ins inside of, of Timelab, which is also nice because you can do something that looks more professional as well. Um, also designing, uh, how do you call it, product design, like building cases and stuff like that. Uh, so that's very useful because usually someone is very good at a certain thing and here you have everything mixed. So the, the goal of the Adam project is actually to, um, to monitor the air quality in Ghent. Specifically in Ghent, because we want to start small. <laughs> but the, the aim is to, to, to uh, give the user direct feedback of the air quality uh, at the, the location where he is. With a little bit of delay probably, but s uh, good enough for people to understand if uh, there, is a, there is an issue with uh, the air pollution. Um, but the also another... Uh, another thing we would like to do is to uh, collect this information and publish it because we think that open data can help governments make better decisions. Um, and so th the idea was um, uh, to create a mobile device 
that uh, collects this information. Um, it from time to time it uploads it to a central location, uh, and that data is then because it's raw data. The device itself doesn't do a lot of uh, calculations or, or um, mathematical or statistical. Um, uh, manipulations, we, we do that centrally, based on all the information we gather. Um, and obviously, the idea is to create public awareness as well, and uh, thanks to some of the, 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 the marketing people that we also have in the project, we have a very fancy ideas of uh, trying to get to the, the public media. Um, uh, because we want to get, we really want to, to get some air play uh, on television and stuff like that once we have this thing going. And why are we doing it? Because we can. <laughs> but not, not just that. The, the idea itself actually um, originated in the fact that one of the, the members, well, one of the, the founders of the Time Lab project, um, um, well, delivered a son, a baby boy, to, the, to, to this world. And uh, he had a, a lung problem. Uh, and he, he was very, uh, or he's still very sensitive to, to air pollution, and especially to fine dust. And this project, in, in, at this moment, we are only uh, focusing on, on uh, what, what they call particulate matter, which is fine dust. Um, but obviously, once we have this finished, and uh, the, the, the second revision of this, this device, we could add more sensors. But the problem, why did we focus on, on fine dust? It's because it's the least known, um, we have the least data of fine dust. So uh, usually the you know, CO or um, um, NOx or all those, or ozone, these are very easy to, to, to monitor and there's lots of data around that, but uh, particulate matter is, is really something that is, you need specific uh, calibrated devices which are quite expensive, so you, yeah. There's not a lot of information about it. And it's, if there's information, it's usually an average or over a long period. And the, the thing with air pollution, it's, it's not about what the average is over a year. It's what you have where you are today on a continuous basis. So that's why we don't think what the government is showing is actually relevant to, to us, to the citizens, to, to everyone. So, um, yeah. So we live in the beautiful city of Ghent, which looks like this. Um, we think it's the most beautiful city in Europe, uh, the world maybe. Um, and we have a lot of, a lot of bicycles. Um, it's a bit like Amsterdam. Um, it's a student city, a lot of students, I think 60,000 students. Um, the, the population is 260,000. Add those students to it, so more than 300,000 uh, people. And the bike is very, very much used. Uh, so our idea was to make a mobile device to put on a bike. Um, we, the, 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 the beautiful city also has two highways and one highway going directly into the city, which is part of the problem, we think. Um, and it's, you can see that from this, this is a picture of uh, last year. It's, it has been renovated while we preferred maybe to have it uh, demolished instead. Um, and I live somewhere at the end of that, so uh, it's, it's green, but don't let the, the, the trees fool you. That doesn't help a lot. Um, so um, in the, the big city of Ghent, we have only two official air pollution stations, and they were strategic strategically chosen to put somewhere. It took, I think, more than one and a half year to decide where to put it, far away from <laughs> a lot of things that, uh, that create pollution. So, um, and we do get, we do meet the European levels, which uh, I, I can show you later, are quite broad. Uh, there is an average for the whole year, so it doesn't matter how many spikes there are. And then there are, I think, 35, you can, you can go over the, the limit 35 times a year or something. Um, but as I said, those yearly averages don't mean a lot, and uh, it's micro measurement that we actually need. So, uh, and that's what we want to change. Um, obviously, like I said, it's not just particulate matter that uh, that makes up the, the the air quality. There are other factors. 
but uh, as I said, it's the least known variable. The city council um, is taking the environment seriously. That's what they say, so uh, yeah, we, uh, we hope that they do. Um, we'll see. There is obviously a lot of frustration with some people because it might bring the city into a bad uh, or a negative publicity. There's also some um, some negativity negativity from the the how do you call it the, the emo do you, is it emo in, in German as well the the people that sell houses uh, they they are afraid that this information will lower the the prices for for houses on b because usually the prices of the houses that are wh where it's the prices are high there is also a lot of pollution because it's those places where a lot of traffic or a lot of uh, you know, the, the buses are, the trams are, things like that, so it's very convenient, but also very, uh, very well, dangerous to our health. The most important thing about my presentation is, in fact, the, the technical side, because this is a technical conference, and this is what the device looks, looks like. It's, it's going to change a bit, but uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, it consists of a few things. Ah, let me first talk about the, the, the goals we have. Um, we want to create an, an open device that we can, um, that we, we can build locally. Because it, the idea is, we, if we are going to create this, this is not something that is specific to Ghent. Everybody could help on this, could use the same device. So we want to build something that everybody can build themselves. So the components we use should be cheap, should be, um, should be easy to, to get hands on. Um, the code is open source, obviously, documentation as open as possible because we have to write it first. <laughs> um, the, the design of the casing, it's, it's, we're using um, yeah, general things that you can buy everywhere with 3D uh, printed pieces. Um, uh, it's, it's a modular design because obviously people want to have different combination of things, so the, the idea is that you can swap drivers or in, in some later version, we can detect which sensors we have, um, and it will automatically adapt to that. Uh, we try to reuse as much as possible in open source because we have limited resources ourselves as well. Uh, and we believe in open source, obviously. And the, the most important thing is that the data will be open. So it's open for everyone to, uh, to make use of it, uh, which also has um, a the, the danger or threat that uh, those people that want to um, put us in a bad spotlight can obviously use that data to manipulate it as well. And that's why um, we have to be very careful to, to uh, indicate what it is, because we're not a scientific project. We measure stuff, but y y as, yeah, the, the information we gather is raw data, cannot use it Im immediately, so we hope that by putting this raw data out, we also attract scientific well, universities that are going to use this information to do something with that. So we have to be careful because it's raw data, and uh, as much as we'd like to tell people, walk here and not over there because that's dangerous, we cannot simply say that. Uh, I will go into that when I talk about the sensors as well. So this is the, the device, this was the, the the first prototype when uh, we knew what pieces we were going to use. Um, this is when you're building it and testing stuff. Once you're certain that it works, it looks like uh, like this. Uh, less, less. Uh, how do you call it? The less connections. Well, the connections are actually fixed. So, um, what are we using? Those that know a little bit about. Uh, Hardware has seen some things. We use the uh, SparkFun ESP8266, uh, which is in fact a Wi-Fi chipset, uh, Wi-Fi chipset. Um, we started off with something something different. the The original idea was to use Bluetooth for uh, communication and use a, a normal microcontroller, but this is actually quite affordable. And with the uh, Wi-Fi on board, we can uh, we can use Wi-Fi, which is much more convenient for sending data uh, back to our own uh, servers. Um, all of the sensors, al uh, almost all of the sensors are uh, I2C. I don't know if it's. Cr 
how do you call it? I square C. Yeah, a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> I square C. Okay, I, I remember that. Uh, what did you say? Inter. Ah, inter. I see. Ah, ah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. L let me add a d big disclaimer. I'm not the mo the, the smartest guy in in the team we have. I mean, uh, I I only joined three months ago. Uh, I I learned all this stuff by doing it. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I well I know I I square C now a bit, but uh, um, I'm not the the writing the drivers myself. Uh, I did write a lot of the code, but not this part. Um, and I'm not that. Uh, uh, experienced with electronics myself, although I'm learning, so uh, it's getting better all the time. We're using the PPD42, uh, it's probably not that known because it's very specific to what we're doing. Um, let me put this down. This is in fact the device. Um, the device actually has um, a resistor underneath to heat up air which we are probably going to remove because it's also using up a lot of the battery power. And the air is sucked in underneath and it's uh, pulled out at the, at the top. This is a black room where there is a, a high sensitive um, um, light sensor. Uh, and um, there is a light beam that actually bounces off the fine dust particles. And we get an interrupt. We get an interrupt for each particle that we see, um, which, if, it, if I come back to what I said earlier, the scientific uh, value of this, uh, usually this, the, the fine dust um, values that are used are based on uh, micrograms per cubic meter. And uh, this only counts dust particles. F um, dust particles, Actually, we have two ty types of dust particles, those that are smaller than 10 micrograms and uh, those that are smaller, no, 10 micrometers, and those that are smaller than uh, two and a half micrometers. So uh, that's the only two factors that we have. So we have to do some calculations to, um, and probably calibration with real, um, real devices to have a sense of how much, uh, how good the, the air quality is, but it will always be something that uh, is relative to other devices. So we cannot say, compared to the official uh, way of measuring, uh, it's this. But if we know, because we have fixed stations and maybe at some time more fixed stations that are calibrated, if a bike crosses that and it senses that information, and we have hundreds of bikes crossing those we can do statistical analysis of all that information and, uh, and compare it. And then we can say this is better, this is worse. We don't know exactly how much better or how much worse, or we could uh, know that, but not with, with, a, with, a, with some, some uh, <laughs> how do you call it, uh, with some differences. Well, but but it's, uh, it, it will not be real scientific, uh, or it cannot be used by, uh, as raw data anyhow. Um, in the device, we, we need some things to, uh, to help us. Um, we have an accelerometer to know if we're moving or not. And we also use it to see if it's been shaken. Because... <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'll come back to that as well. Um, but. Obviously, we want to know when we're moving because we want to go into a low battery mode if we're standing still. And if we're not moving, we can also test the Wi-Fi to see if there is a, a, Wi-Fi, a Wi-Fi SSID that we know about and to try and get our data out. Um, was there something else that I wanted to say about accelerometer? No. Uh, the humidity sensor, uh, there is a humidity sensor on it. In fact, the humidity sensor is, does also uh, does temperature, but the accelerometer has a temperature sensor as well. The air pressure sensor has a temperature sensor as well, so we have uh, three times the same information. Um, the humidity is important because uh, there is a relation between, between fine dust and, and humidity. So if we want to take that into account as well, we need this information. 
at the same place and the same time as uh, as the other information. Air pressure is the same. Um, with the humidity sensor and the air pressure sensor, we also want to see if it's raining, for instance. If, if we don't know if we can get that out of there. Uh, in the, but it may help us to get this information. We could obviously also take into account uh, other uh, weather information that is public, like the air, where the air is coming from and, and, and uh, the speed of the, the air. Um, but at the moment, we're not taking that into account, but this is something to correlate as well, so it would be nice to see if what, 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 the, what the influence is of air at a certain location on the air uh, pollution. And then we have the, the, the biggest troublemaker in our set, it's the GPS. And why is this a big problem? Um, the GPS requires a serial communication. Um, we are limited in the number of uh, pins we have on this uh, SparkFun ESP8266. And it's a, it's a pain for us. Uh, so there are GPS, GPS devices that have an I2C interface. And in fact, this one, has one as well, but we cannot make it work for some reason. So uh, we try to connect those pins, but we cannot uh, cannot make it work. Um, if you look on the internet for uh, I2C GPSs, they all have this uh, electronic stuff in between to convert between your serial and your I2C. So the idea now, with a lot of regret, uh, because I want to keep things simple, uh, but the only affordable way to do this except for buying the I2C GPS, which is quite expensive. It, uh, it adds 15 euros or 20 euros on top of uh, the, the price we ha prices we have now. Um, so we're thinking of using the Arduino Pro Mini, create firmware. Actually, there is a project that creates firmware for serial to I2C interfaces. So we're, we, we're now looking at that, but this is the part that is not implemented now. In fact, we're using the GPS with a serial interface at the moment, and we don't have a buzzer. And uh, that's how we do it. But actually, we need two pins if we also want to talk to the GPS to configure it properly. Uh, so actually, this is the way to go. Uh, obviously, if you have better ideas. <laughs> yes, yes. Indeed. In indeed. The, the original idea was to only have to read from the GPS. But the problem is it's sending a lot of information, it's buffering, it it's makes no sense at all. And you can configure the GPS to only give you information every one second or uh, things like that. Or you can also say, I only want this type of information with, with the more advanced GPSs. Um, but indeed, if we can have this one process the information, we have it in the correct format that we need. Um, Yeah. 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 It's true. Um, the the communication of the device, but I will show you later. We are using JSON for communicating everything well to the serial console for testing and also to send it out uh, over Wi-Fi. So the information, well. If you want to have the details about how we store the information, we can discuss this later. Uh, <coughs> because we also created something fancy to, to use as little storage as, as possible. Uh, th there's also, we, we are planning to also add the, an I2C memory, uh, to, to have more memory for buffering more information. Um, but at the moment for testing, we don't need it yet. So as I showed you this is the, the current device. When I joined, there was not a lot of code produced. We did have some test code for the individual sensors. And um, when I joined, I didn't know what I could help with. So I started with documenting everything, which is nice, because then I know a little bit about the, the, the different sensors and how the, the project was conceived. Um, but I very quickly started to write the main loop. And uh, the main loop is something that is, uh, I knew a little bit of Arduino that you had the setup and the, the how is it called, the, the main loop. Um, 
but I didn't know how to to get something like this going. And when I, the first the first time I tried to implement this, I had a lot of if else statements, and it was a lot of it was interesting because it learned uh, to me it was interesting to learn how this this would work. But then the second revision it became better. We started to use cases, and then I had an epiphany, which is probably for most of you very obvious um, to use a state machine. A state machine and a state machine written with uh, double cases, uh, double uh, switch um, blocks, one for determining which state we are in and uh, changing states, and the other one to, um, to, to have the state transition as well. Because we want to run something when we are in one of the states, we want to run something continuously and if we're going to move from one state to the other, we have to do some preparation or breaking down stuff while we're moving. Um, and so there are, if, if you look at the code, and I can go over that if there's interest and there is, if there's time, um, it looks very neat now. So uh, I learned a lot with that as well. Um, the thing is, when we start the, the device, the start state is actually not a real state, it's the, the, the beginning. It's, it's the, what we are when we start the device, and we quickly go into sleep mode. And depending on information coming from the sensor, we go to different, we go to different uh, states. So if you're in, if you're in sleep mode, we're not moving because if we're moving, we go to the GPS test state. If we're not moving, but it was shaken, we go to the config state, which brings up a Wi-Fi uh, uh, access point where you can connect to, and then you can configure the SSIDs you want to use for uh, uploading your data. Uh, you can also say if the device is sta stationary or not, because we also want to have non-mobile devices at some point. And we also want to know if the device is located indoor or outdoor, because we are, for, for the project itself, we're only interested in outdoor information. But as a, as a person, <laughs> I would like to know what the information is indoor. So um, that's something that you can configure in the config stage. And after some time, or OK is pressed or whatever, we go back to sleep. If we are moving, we enable the GPS, and we are waiting until we get sensible information. If we get proper information and the GPS is ready and we're still moving, we go into the collect state. I can show you this, but not here because I don't have GPS here. Um, but I show you because we also added some debugging commands. So through the serial, you can say GPS is ready, even though it isn't. Uh, we fake that we're moving. We fake that we have GPS. And then we can test going to all these uh, states. Uh, same for the Wi-Fi test. If we are uh, not moving and the buffer is not empty, so we have data, uh, we will probably add some periods in here that from time to time we want to check if Wi-Fi, because it, it's, it's very, again, it's, we, don't, we want to save the battery as much as possible. We go into Wi-Fi test. If we have a fix for the Wi-Fi, we upload our information. Um, and then we go back, and we go back to sleep. So it's very easy. And I wish I had this from the beginning. Um, the firmware design, as I stated, uh, the most important thing was code readability because we want people to, to help and to, to join the, the, the project and to be able to adapt it to their own needs. It's a simple state machine with state transitions, as we call them. Um, yeah, we, we want to have the IC, I, I2C bus scanning, which may be possible. It depends. I don't know how, the, uh, how unique the IDs are, but... That's the problem. I, 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 but maybe for the sensors that we are at, maybe it's possible. I, we'll have to see. And then, even if the IDs are not unique, if you know that there are multiple, you can test. Uh, you can test if it works. Um, and we are working through GitHub. So, as I said, everything is open source. Um, we also have in GitHub uh, individual test examples for individual drivers and libraries to to test uh, if our own. Usually we have wrapper libraries for the, for sensors if they are working correctly or uh, to configure them or to, to, to stuff with them. We also have a PCB design, but the first PCB design we have to redo, but it looks a bit like this. Um, you can find, uh, how is it called, KiCut or KiCut? So we have KiCut drawings, but we'll, we have to do that. So this is the, the current status. 
Um, before I arrived in the project, they already did a lot uh, of selecting sensors and also for the fine dust uh, sensor. There are a few of them and they have all been tested together with a calibrated device. Um, so I was not part of that, but that also took a lot of time to, uh, to find what was the best combination of all that. Um, and now we're here, we're, we're busy doing the second prototype using the, the GPS I, I square C. Uh, we hope to finish this uh, in the next few months. To be honest, we had hoped to finish the, f the first prototype with everything working uh, before the holidays, but uh, we didn't make it, uh, especially because of the, the GPS. If we would have made the I square C GPS uh, pins uh, to work, then it could have worked but it seems it's not that easy to do. Then there are lots of functionality. Every time we have a meeting and new people join the meeting, they have the same or new ideas and it's very nice, but it doesn't bring us to a working device. So while this is very nice and if you have new ideas, let me know because I'm going to make a list of them um, to shortcut every uh, um, deviation of uh, <laughs> discussions we have but one of the things is uh, that's also why we have this uh, this accelerometer is that we can measure if we if on a bike if we have lots of bumps and if lots of bikes have lots of bumps at the same place we can give this information to those bike uh, organizations that uh, discuss with the government that the bikes roads should be better um, as I said we want to include more sensor data or sensor information Although for some of these we ha already have a lot of um, a lot of uh, devices in Ghent, so some of the information is already available, but may not be open. Um, we want to support outside and in-house stationary devices. Uh, as I said, we are living very close to the end of uh, the highway. Um, there's lots of traffic jams before our house, and so it would be nice to know exactly what to do. Should we open the front windows? No, I told my wife. Never open them except maybe at specific in the weekends or we always use the back windows. Um, but having that data would probably also for the awareness create a lot of uh, people thinking about what they should do or how they should handle. Um, auto calibration of devices, I told you, if we pass each other we could, we could think of not calibrating the device itself because we only want to have the raw data from the device also because if that information is somehow not usable because the device is somehow broken we want to know we want to see that uh, when we're trying to put everything together and make checks of the the data quality um, there is the idea of if we have this data which is already properly um, manipulated to get real information out of that. We want to be able to have an application that gives you that same information even though you don't need the sensors in your device. That would be nice as well. It would also be nice to know what times of the day or what days it's better and when, what days it's worse and, and stuff like that. Or what the, the influence of the, of the weather is. Um, it would also be nice to uh, to be able to show that in real time for, for instance, people that are waiting in their traffic jams, causing the traffic jam, that they see what uh, the, the quality is. Or even have those devices inside of your car, because inside of the car it's also not quite healthy. And if they know that, maybe if we all start to use the bike, there's no problem anymore. Yeah. Well, it, I'm not sure if it is. Because the fine dust, I don't know if they can filter that out. Yeah. And the ultra fine dust is even worse. And that's, that we cannot measure with this equipment, so it's, uh, that's even worse. And if you know that, well, I have some slides if we have some time or there are some questions. After the questions, I have some slides about uh, the different types of uh, pollution and the sizes of each. Because smoke, if you're cigarette smoke, is very, very bad. It's, uh, it's ultra fine dust in some cases, so uh, yeah. This is the project information if you're interested in, in maybe joining a residency because you have a nice ID. This is the time lab information. Unfortunately, well, it's mostly Dutch, but I think there's some translated stuff. Unfortunately, the website of the Adam project, which is the website to the public, that one is in Dutch. 
the GitHub, everything is in English, but for the communication to the citizens, it's uh, unfortunately it's Dutch, but we have Google Translate, I guess. Um, if you're interested about air quality in general, where you are living, you can find that information. Um, I don't know what, what I should do. Should, let's do first questions and then I can show you some, some information. Because when I said we're doing this in Ghent, there is a good reason why we do it in Ghent. Ghent is one of the worst in, in Western Europe. So uh, that's why I think it makes sense to, to do this. Together with Antwerp, which is the, major, the, the, the largest city in Flanders. Um, there's also an interesting project from Switzerland, which is actually predating everything that I found. Uh, they have this very massive device with lots of sensors. They're, they're testing almost everything. And they've been put on top of the trams um, for continuously. I think there's still there is a second open sense project now uh, where they're trying to improve what they're doing. But this one is nice because it gets all the information for, for all the different uh, yeah, pollutions um, and you can see that if one is high usually the others are high as well so they go together uh, depending on the source if it's uh, cars or uh, combustion then it's uh, usually the same thing so let me first ask if there are any questions and then maybe I can show you some more slides about uh, specific information It's a good, yeah, whether an event loop would be better than, uh, well, a sleep loop. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I think for an event loop, you have to, I think, it w wouldn't it be use more battery? I don't know. I don't know exactly how uh, an event loop would work in this case. <laughs> I, well, it, it's C++, but it's uh, it's the Arduino kind of C++. They do a lot of a lot of things in between, so to make it easier for children or for for uh, grown-ups to. Yeah, we are using that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not a very good C++ programmer. I can do C, but C++ for me was also something new. But yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently there is a university and at Castle has a project like this as well, but you couldn't get in contact with them and it would be nice because it's EU funded. It would be nice to to share information. Uh, yeah. I'll look it up. Yeah, so the question is, um, in, in specifically to the casing, but also to other uh, information, uh, what if um, the conditions change and the, obviously the, the information we gather is also based on that, um, yes, the, well, in, in, in this case, speed or, or wind airflow or things like that. Especially if you have a, inside a house or stationary devices where you may not have enough airflow to get proper information, right? Yes, so th that's why we want to get the raw data. 
the, 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 the speed and stuff like that, we want to get that also centrally, yeah, so that we can take that into account. But we have to do more testing before we can make any conclusive statements out of that. And I'm not a big data or, a, or even a, a statistical engineer that, can, that knows how this works. But we do have people that have, um, that have this background, that also are part of invent, uh, environmental uh, action groups, that have this background and that can, uh, that can do this, uh, that are part of the env environmental study groups inside of universities. So they are involved, but they are not part of, the, the part of it yet because we don't have data yet. At this moment, we are not collecting anything. So, uh, But yes, this is something that we have to take into account, definitely. And th for the casing itself, we have to make sure that the temperature, for instance, uh, is outside temperature and not inside temperature. We have to make sure that uh, the, the, the airflow is, cr is, is, is good enough. In fact, the, the design of the casing will do something, and I, I forgot what the name was, but there is this, um, this uh, physics, uh, ah, I sh I'll have to add that to my presentation for the next time. I have to ask my colleagues. Um, there is something where you have different, uh, densi well, well, the different size of, of the tube that will suck in air. There is something in physics that, that will cause this, and this is what we're going to use as well. So that uh, because of, uh, I don't know, the, the, the fact that there is an under pressure somewhere, it sucks in air. But I'll have to add that to the, yeah. Sorry that I. <laughs> uh, ah, and why would you? Congratulations, it's the first time I hear this ID, so I'm going to write it down. It's interesting as well, special for those action groups. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would be interesting to have as well. Yeah. Um, it depends. It, it could, but it depends on the, on the, the dust from... from uh, Yeah, yeah. Th I think the device cannot uh, cannot see uh, cigarette smoke at this moment. No, it depends on the size of the of the particles and cigarette smoke is. I can show you. Let me show you. If if we could measure it, yes. So uh, if you look here at the the types of uh, stuff we find in the air. Um, so, particulate matter is somewhere here in between this. So, it's dust. And uh, I think you see oil smoke is inside of this. Um, because we are measuring 10 to 2.5. Lower than 10 and lower than 2.5. But I don't know what the, what the smallest, it depends on, the, on the, the light sensor. I don't know what the smallest particle is that we can measure. That's a, that's a problem. That's something we have to, we have to see for ourselves. Um, but tobacco smoke, you see, it's it's lower smog as well. So I think that, it, I, I don't know, I couldn't say. We have to test. Fact is that when we were testing the, 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 the sensor inside of time lab, we also tested it with someone smoking, and we could see that the smoking also has those particles that are larger. So we could see that smoking did have an effect on the sensor. But the, the, the question is how much the, does it influence? The smaller you go, the deeper it goes into the lungs, but also the smaller the particle is. So it's a, it's a, but it the, s the smaller you go, it the better, the, the the worse for for the lungs. That's a fact. Yeah, and it also goes into the blood then. So if it's very small, I don't know exactly which. I read about it, but I, I forgot uh, what size actually. But ultra fine dust actually goes into your blood as well, so into your bloodstream. So. Uh, it doesn't stick into the lungs, but it goes into your whole body. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's first. Yeah. 
It, that's a good question. We have to we have to find out. Uh, we have to find out by getting the first devices out and testing how well they they behave compared to calibrated uh, devices. Yeah, it's something we have to find out. Uh, the reason why we chose bikes is because we we think it's better than uh, runners, for instance, where you have a lot of more uh, shocks and and uh, probably the the device wears out quicker. So we hope that bikes are better for that, but also because bikes take a longer distance, so we can we can measure more. So I th we think bikes is a good idea, but we will have to see how well the devices can hold up against shocks, weather conditions, and stuff like that. It depends how well our case design will is. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So in the winter, there's a lot of heating from houses. I have another slide with sources of pollution. Um, uh, let me see if I can find that one. Yeah, th that's this one. Uh, so what what influences pollution? Obviously, industry cars, but also indoor heating, uh, which which influences the outdoor pollution. But if you're cooking. Candles are very, very bad. Don't use candles in house. It's, it's. Uh, I told my wife, and we, we bought those LED device, but she, she, it's not the same feeling. And but don't use candles in house. Ventilation in your house also makes a, a big difference. If you're cooking, you should open a, a window, especially if in house the pollution is worse than outside. But how do you know, right? Um, also, don't open your windows in the evening or during the night because then houses are being warmed. Uh, you have the heating in your house, which causes pollution as well. So a lot of people uh, think traffic jams are solved, uh, no, no pollution anymore. We open the windows. That's, that's not the case, unfortunately. Early in the morning is probably best but because then the dust settles. The pollution, fine dust pollution, is also worse lower to the ground than up because it's settled, obviously, so something to take into con consideration as well. There are f uh, very nice studies about uh, the influence on th of things. Um, in, in Antwerp and in Ghent, I think I have to finish, eh? but uh, in Antwerp and in Ghent, um, there were projects where they, um, they distributed plants uh, for a sp specific period of time, and then they, they did a study on the plants. They used this um, ferromagnetic scientific way of measuring fine dust, because fine dust often also has small, uh, well, iron or metal uh, pieces in it. And uh, that was a way to see uh, what the pollution was. Uh, and those studies were very interesting as well, because apparently if you, if you live on a big road like I'm doing, you get a lot of fine dust in front of your house. But the street behind it is, is, it depends on the air flow, obviously, but it's a lot less. And that's why I said open the, the back side, uh, the, the windows at the back of your house and not in front of your house. But obviously, if you have a ventilation, if you have an old house like ours, the ventilation uh, probably screws up anyhow. So <laughs> <coughs> There are also natural sources of pollution, obviously, which you cannot do anything against. And cars, electrical cars are the future, yeah? no pollution anymore. Wrong, because the big part of the of the pollution are the tires, yeah, and the the electrical cars are he more heavy, so they have a mo lot more uh, pollution from tires. But it's better than combustion engines, obviously. But still, you had a question? Yes. Well, the heater we're not going to use because the heater is actually used to get air into it, to have an, an air circulation. And since we're moving, we're using that. And also with this physical, uh, with, with this tube thing that also sucks in air, um, this we think this would help. Um, but it's true that um, to get statistical information out of the sensor, uh, we have to measure for 30 seconds or something. So in 30 seconds, you already have, on a bike, you can do a lot of, meters so that's one of the concerns so the information we get we have to we have to yeah we have to 
we know where we are, that's a good thing, and we know where, we, where, we, where we we're biking, so we have a, an idea of what we have measured, but it will not be a specific place, it will be on a road. But if we have enough bikes, then this will all fade away and we get better results. But you're right, um, it, we don't have that information instantly. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, go, uh, I'm definitely going to check, but indeed a pump we, can, we cannot do. We, we also consider doing something like that, but it's, it's, it's too expensive. It's, uh, it breaks e more easy because it's mechanical and stuff like that. So we really want to have something cheap and get awareness first. Um, so as I said, it's not completely scientific. It could be improved, but the more data we have, the better for us. Um, how much time do I have? It's over. So. So what did you, <laughs> what slides did you not see? <laughs> but this is uh, this additional slides. These are the projects that existed, uh, the strawberry plants, ivy plants. Uh, there is a new with collection tubes, which is more scientific even for, uh, I don't know uh, how, how it's called, NO2, but what the, the pricing, so the, the device, the price of the device without bulk uh, prices, because with bulk prices we can probably make this less but at the moment it's 60 euros and you can see the big uh, the big price consumers um, and then I, I also have but I put the slides on on the website if you're interested about air pollution at your location you can find that link and you can you can look it up but uh, yeah as you can see we're living here not very good um, and it's Italy and Turkey is very bad but also Eastern Europe is also very bad, so... Uh, yeah. 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 In general, we lose nine months of our life, or one year of our life, due to air pollution, but that, due to air pollution, but that's an average, of course, so it could be more. If you're a smoker, it could add up to 10, 10 years of your life. If you're unlucky, if you're lucky, you can become 100 years. Uh. <laughs>